make anti-takeover provisions, uh, the usual things that we put in, uh, in a G index, so things that prevent or preclude or may prevent or preclude hostile takeovers. We have some evidence on the negative effect on firm value. The original evidence is cross-sectional, as we've seen this morning. Although we've contributed to this literature by showing some causal evidence about this uh, negative value effect. Uh, and the fact that this, there are some value effects here kind of gives you a hint that these things may matter somewhere. Uh, so the research question of this paper is to study the very direct, the very mechanical effects of anti-takeover provisions on the actual takeovers and the price paid for those. And in particular, there are three channels, three obvious channels through which these things may matter. They may affect the probability of a takeover happening. They may affect the price paid for such a takeover, the premium that shareholders may get for such transaction. And there may be also some implicit incentive uh, effects, like you know, the ones induced by the takeover effect. Now, we're going to talk mostly about the more mechanical part, the first two here, takeover probability and takeover premium. And what we teach to our students, the popular wisdom is that these things, at some level, they must prevent takeovers, but they are good bargaining chip for CEOs once the takeover is about to happen, right? So there's a kind of trade-off between quantity and price, right? Now, the fact, despite this, the empirical evidence is fairly limited, the fact, despite the fact that there are a lot of papers, and it's often contradictory, right? And also establishing causality here is a big challenge, right? So what's the research goal today? We're going to try to establish a causal effect of anti-takeover provisions on takeovers. And we're going to try to decompose those effects into three moving parts. One moving part is going to depend only on the probability of a takeover happening. Do I make more or less money as a shareholder because I have more or less takeovers because of these provisions? The second, moving, the second element would have a moving, the only moving part is going to be the price, the premium, but careful, the premium fixing the firm. So a firm that's going to be taken over regardless of whether they have a provision or not, is this provision going to give better price or worse price in this particular deal? And the third moving part, which is maybe harder to grasp, is going to be a selection effect. If these things change the, the amount, the quantity of takeovers that happen in equilibrium, the firms that are taken over are different. So are these firms, do they have more synergies, less synergies, are they bigger, are they smaller? These things are going to matter in terms of value creation. And different constituencies of the firm, by the way, may care about different parts. So the workers would probably care mostly about the probability, maybe the managers as well. Uh, a regulator would care mostly about selection effects and probability, not much about the price, which is quite a transfer. So different constituents of, of, you know, involved in this transaction may care about these different parts. So it's not just looking inside the black box. I think each of these parts has an element of interest. Now, to just give you an idea, I'm going to try to summarize the takeover market in a diagram, right? So I'm going to put here the takeover premium paid for a deal. I'm going to plot here the distribution of the observed <coughs> deals in this market. And I'm going to add here all the firms that are not taken over as a probability mass. So I'm going to assign them a premium of zero, right? I'm going to put all the firms in the diagram, including those that are not taken over. Now, of course, the probability of a takeover can be measured like by integrating these premiums here, or just by one minus this mass probability here. We can also measure the premium, the average premium paid for deals by just integrating this, this, this kind of uh, uh, segment here through this probability. And we can also calculate some measure of shareholder value by looking at the whole distribution, which firms get taken over and which firms don't, and which prices are paid for each of these deals, right? So and this is what we're going to call the unconditional premium. Unconditional in the sense that it's not conditional or takeover, it includes those deals that don't happen. Okay, so suppose that we had two twin populations, same distribution, same population of firms in this type of world, and we apply a randomized treatment. To some of them, we ask them to, control, to keep their anti-takeover provisions. To some of them, we force them to drop their anti-takeover provisions. Things are going to happen to the treatment group, right? And the question is, what can we measure here? What can we really identify here? Well, the first obvious thing, we can measure the effect on the probability. By comparing these two mass points or these, this, these two surfaces, we can see whether dropping these provisions increases or decreases takeovers. The second thing we can also measure is shareholder values, or the, the mechanical part of shareholder values through takeovers, by just integrating the whole two diagrams, you know, for the treatment and the control group, including the zeros, right? Now, what the literature does, not only with anti-takeover provisions, but with most questions, is to look at these two things. 
the average premium paid for takeovers conditional on a takeover. And you can see that this is a very weird animal because these two groups of firms are two different populations of firms. They are selected not because the data is bad, because the problem is like that, right? These are not the same population of firms, so how can I compare the premiums paid for these two populations of firms if they are different sets of firms? There's no, the, 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 the beauty of the randomized treatment is gone once you look at premiums. Ideally, you would like to decompose the effect on a causal effect on the firms that were going to be taken over anyway and measure these two populations, and also a selection effect. Where do the new firms fall relative to the other firms when they are taken over? Are they better firms or are they worse firms? Do they have a higher premium or a lower premium? Right? So this is the nature of what we're trying to do, this decomposition. We're going to have the total shareholder gains of dropping anti decode provision decomposed into three moving parts. One that depends only on probabilities, one that depends only on premium, and one that depends only on selection. And these are the formulas that we formally developed in the paper for this, right? You don't need to worry about this today. But there are two challenges here. First of all, I told you, suppose we have a randomized experiment, but we don't. So first thing, we need to establish causality, exogeneity of the treatment, dropping anti provision in something that this resembles a randomized experiment. But second, even if we have that, we need to deal with selection. So we need to do something else to deal with the idea that we have inherent selection in the problem. So in terms of exogeneity, we're going to start from something similar to what we did before. We're going to look at information in shareholder votes. We think that close call votes of, about dropping or keeping anti the provision do have information about, you know, you can see close call votes as firms assigned to each side of the, of the discontinuity as randomly assigned. Um, but that's not going to be enough. We need to extrapolate this to the whole population. Remember, we're decomposing. So we're going to use a new technique, a new approach proposed by Angris and Rokanen. We're going to have a matching model that basically weights firms according to their likelihood to drop or not drop an entity cover provision that is validated by the regression discontinuity design. So we're going to use the RDD as a way to validate our matching model. In terms of selection, we're not going to be able to pin down everything, but at least we're going to be able to bound how important it may be. So we're going to use a bounce approach to try to give you how important it is. So some advanced results in case I run out of time. So anti takeover provisions have a negative effect on all three bits, price, probability, and selection. Second thing, selection is important. If you don't take into account selection, you're missing about between 25 and 50% of the effect. You need to take into account, if you're thinking of any paper on takeovers and premiums, you need to think of selection there. And it's not selection of your data, it's a selection that is inherent in the problem. There doesn't seem to be a trade-off between price and probability in our results. And, and you may be puzzled, so how can it be that dropping anti decode provision gives you a better price? So we look into this, and we find that dropping anti decode provision, or keeping it, you know, in this, in this slide, keeping anti decode provision gives you lower competition among bidders, or if you drop it, you have more competitive ones. It, has, it gives you a worse match between the bidder and the target. Uh, and we also have ambiguous results in terms of bargaining. On the one hand, you have more bidders that improves your bargaining. On the other hand, the individual bargaining power with each of them may be better, but the net seems to be ambiguous. Okay? So this is it. Now I'm going to do everything again, a bit more technical, maybe a bit faster. Okay? <laughs> so data, we get some data on votes from risk metrics. We get some data on takeovers from SDC Platinum. We define a takeover happening five years within the vote as our dependent variable. And the takeover premium we just take between four weeks before the announcement until completion, although we have robustness checks in the paper about this. And this is a very standard RDD. So here we have votes on dropping an anti takeover provision. These are shareholder sponsored proposals. Zero means a draw. We've centered everything at zero. Uh, these are just means, and this is just a smoothing, an optimal smoothing. Right? Now you can see that the kind of endogenous relationship between votes and takeovers is negative. This is a downward sloping function, but it's truncated at zero. At zero, something discontinuous happens, which is that you are more likely to drop this provision. Right? You can also see that if you just throw an OLS regression here, anything can happen because of the selection problem, sorry, because of the endogeneity problem that we are facing. But the, the effect at the discontinuity is unambiguously positive. Right? So we have an RDD estimate of about 9% additional chance over a five-year period. A conditional premium, remember this is the premium with the zeros, so including the firms that don't get taken over, similar story, we get an RDD estimate of about 4% additional 
premium paid for, for takeovers once you drop a provision. Okay, so now, next trick. We want to extrapolate this to the whole population, right? And we're going to use an idea from Angris and Rokanen, and the idea is the following. In the RTD paradigm, the only source of heterogeneity is the vote. If you have two firms with the same vote, they come from the same population of firms, right? Now, if the votes were random, that's great. You could just run ordinary regressions, and you would be fine. And the problem is that the votes are not random. They are endogenous. Now, what do you do? What do we always do? We add excess, we add controls, that conditioning on those controls, you make the votes random, as if they were random. But the problem is that you cannot typically test. You cannot test when you run an OLS regression, you cannot test whether your conditional independence assumption is right or wrong. But here we can. We can check that our set of controls does actually make the vote irrelevant in explaining an outcome variable, our outcome variables. So once we do that, we find a model for which the vote becomes irrelevant, we're going to run a matching estimator using that same model that has been validated by the RDD setting. Today I'm going to propose you a very simple model that has some measures of size, of profitability, liquidity, some industry measures, some governance measures, and some year dummies. And you can see, here's what I showed you before, these are the residuals of regressions that include those controls, that they do a good job in flattening the relationship. Right? Excellent job, actually, on the probability, and quite a good job on the premium here. Right? So this is going to be a valid model that we can use to kind of find twins with respect to uh, the probability of being on each side of the discontinuity. Okay, so what do we have here? We have a matching model. We're matching firms of the equal likelihood, reweighting them so they have equal likelihood to be dropping or not dropping an anti provision. Uh, with and without controls to different sets of, of uh, models, the takeover probability of a five-year period in the whole population, if you, if you vote to drop an anti-takeover provision, drops, sorry, goes up by about 4.5% over a five-year period. That's about 0.9% per year. The unconditional premium, this is the closest thing to shareholder value, goes up by 2.7% if you drop it, okay? depending on specifications. So in terms of what we've done, this is my objective. I can populate these two, the total shareholder gains and the causal effect on the probability. Okay? Now, next step, I need to populate these other two. Right? And here I'm going to use another different technique. So the idea here is, suppose that the effect of ATPs on takeover probability is monotonic, that they either increase or decrease takeovers, or zero. Right? Now, if I drop an integral provision, the set of firms that merge is a subset of the firms that would have merged anyway. Right? So I can bound the best and worst case scenario of selection. Let me do it with a graph. Uh, so these are the firms with anti takeover provisions. About 10% of those merge or are subject to a takeover. These are the firms without an anti takeover provision. About 14% of those are taken over. So there's 28% additional firms here that are not there. But under monotonicity, I know these ones are there, but there are some additional ones. Now, what's the worst case scenario in terms of selection? The worst case, case, scenario, the worst case scenario is that these are the firms that are selected, this like, right tail. Right? The best case scenario for finding a positive result is that these are the firms that are selected. So what I'm going to do is going to, I'm going to trim those populations and compare them with the control group. Now I have the same amount of observations of, you know, of population observation in both selections. So I I'm going to have two estimates, an upper bound and a lower bound for the causal effect. Remember, this is the effect on the premium of a given firm, fixing the firm, right? I'm not going to have a, a point estimate. I'm going to have some bounds. OK, so just focus on column one. These are mostly robustness checks. So this is the column we use for the decomposition. This is the premium I told you about before. The, the effect on a given firm ranges between a positive effect of 5.5%, that is conditional being subject to a takeover, the premium would be between 5.5% higher to zero. Could be zero, it's not gonna be negative, which is the common wisdom that we have, that these things help you bargain a better price. In the data, it doesn't show up, right? And by the way, this bounding procedure often gives you huge bounds. This is a very strong result, because we're using a very, very coarse kind of measure, right? And still, you know, across specification, it never, it's never negative. So now I can populate the whole expression. I can tell you that 
among within shareholder value, the quantity effect, the probability effect is about half of the story. There are more takeovers, full stop, right? Now, the price effect would be between zero and 25% of the value, depending on the bound that you pick. And the selection effect ranges between 50% and 25%. By the way, I didn't say the selection effect is positive. So the marginal firms that get taken over are firms that are more valuable in the sense that they receive higher premiums, whatever you know, the, that means in terms of welfare. Okay, so I could have stopped here. I have one minute to you'd be puzzled, you know, why this thing happens? Why do we have higher prices? You know, it seems puzzling. Uh, so potential drivers, lower anti provisions may attract more competitive bids. Uh, potentially, the matching is also improved because you have better bidders. Also, think of it, if you have barriers, the CEO decides and balances <laughs> private benefits of control and shareholder value. But if you have no barriers, really, the, the auction decides and you get higher shareholder value, right? Uh, plus, there's the bargaining story, which go, would go kind of against us, except that you have more bidders. So in the traditional auction theory, you have more bidders. That kind of is mo much more important than the individual bargaining power with each of them. I'm not going to bother you with the tables, but I, I, I'm going to show you what we find. So we do find that there is indeed more competition if you drop anti takeover provision. There are more bidders. There are more challenge deals, like unsolicited deals. There are more cash deals, which are typically uh, kind of indicative of more competition. <laughs> uh, the effect on the acquired premium, like on the bargaining, is ambiguous. And we have counteracting forces, so it's not obvious that it would come either way. But we have better matching. We have larger bidders. We have more strategic bidders belonging to the same sector of the firm. Uh, and we have more total synergies measured in dollars, right? When you have lower barriers, it's a better matching between bidder and target. So to conclude, uh, after rejecting an activity goal provision, the merger probability increases by 4.5%, about almost 1% per year. The expected shareholder value, if you want, increases by 2.7%. Uh, we've decomposed it. Selection is important. You need to take it into account. Uh, and the costal premium effect is explained by competition, better matching, and uh, no bargaining effect. Let me say exactly the same thing in 30 seconds, but re-wrapping it. So, we identify several times in which entity provisions on average destroy value. There's a lower likelihood of a deal happening. There's worse selection of targets. The, the marginal targets that get taken over are much better targets. And there's worse selection of bidders. Some bidders shy away from bidding because of these defenses. Uh, but the division of gains seems to be almost like going to the target shareholders. So there's no bargaining there. Uh, and I've shown you basically a couple of uh, techniques to actually disentangle these things that could be useful beyond anti takeover provisions, but are in general for the merger literature. Thank you. Okay, so I don't really know how much time I have, uh, and it's uh, a paper that requires uh, discussing because it's uh, you know, fairly advanced. Uh, so I start with you know, a, a, a simple trend that you're probably aware of is that takeover defenses have been uh, massively voted down in the last 10 years. In the 90s, almost none of these takeover defenses were removed following a vote, and now, uh, every year you have about 50 defenses that are removed from S&P 1500 firms. So the question that the paper asks is whether we should expect the takeover market to change drastically following such a trend because the removal of these defenses uh, might affect both the quantities, so the probability of a takeover, and the price, which is the, the premium that the acquirer pays. So of course, this is an old question, uh, there are like many different generations of papers asking this question since the 80s. Every cluster of papers has come up with a huge debate because there were lots of conflicting results. Uh, every one of these papers is cited by the firms themselves, by consultants. Uh, this is very important. This is likely to be the next paper cited by everybody in the next proxy season uh, for those who <coughs> don't want to have uh, takeover defenses. Um, uh, so the approach is to focus on, on what happens after shareholder votes on uh, these takeover defenses and it has two contributions. Of course, it has this surprising result, surprising in the sense that uh, people usually think that removing takeover defenses should 
decrease the premium. Uh, I mean, of course, there are justifications for that, but it's still surprising relative to the existing literature. And of course, there's a, a major uh, econometric advance in that paper because it's addressing two, two major hurdles. <coughs> One is that they try to distinguish causation from correlation. And I should say here that it's not an RDD paper. It's not an RDD estimate. It's a matching estimate. The only thing is that usually when you do matching, you never know uh, whether, the unobserved, whether there are unobserved determinants of a treatment that affect the outcome. Here you know, and because of that, you can falsify the matching approach. So the RDD is just used as a way to <laughs> falsify the matching approach. What's the advantage of using matching is that you can estimate the full distribution of treatment effect, not just the treatment at the threshold, but the full distribution of treatment effect for almost any firm. And that's, of course, much more interesting for, for excellent validity and for, for other reasons as well. Uh, that puts me to the second hurdle that the paper addresses, and it is that, uh, of course, there's a selection issue when you're looking at uh, premium conditional on an event taking place, which itself is, a is uh, affected by the treatment. So here, uh, they use this uh, bounding, bounding approach. So I would just like to say two things about that, is that there is an assumption there, and it is that the treatment has to affect the probability of takeover only in one direction. It has to always increase or not affect the probability of a takeover, but it cannot for some increase it and for some others decrease it. Otherwise, this whole bounds approach <coughs> fails completely. And I think that in that context, it's not clear that you, sh you should expect that uh, there is monotonicity. Uh, but you might also think, oh, but why is it that they are coming up with all these fancy techniques? But it turns out that, in fact, if you want to use this bounds approach, you need to estimate the full distribution of treatment effects causally. So, and that requires something beyond RDD. So that's why these two approaches are really one and the same thing. You can't have one without the other. The paper will not say anything significant with, with these two innovative techniques. So uh, uh, then it, 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 it's important to try to square the results they get with the stylus facts on, uh, on takeover removal. So as I said, there has been a massive increase in uh, support for proposals wishing to remove takeover defenses. And there also, there's also been a massive increase in the degree to which management responds positively to these shareholder requests. So that's the, the, the orange line is the rate of implementation of winning proposals to remove takeovers, and the green line is the number of proposals that reach majority. So you would expect, given the estimates, that, well, maybe uh, following that, the takeover market has become much more active. And that's actually the reverse. So the takeover market has actually uh, gone down in, in, its, in its degree of activity. So, and, that, and this is drawn from your paper. If I just look at the merger probability over time, you see that it was very high in the 90s where there were lots of takeover defenses and very low now when the, many of them have been, have been removed. I'm not saying that this uh, necessarily contradicts with your, your result, but more that you, you, you really need to discuss you know, why is there a discrepancy between these macro trends about uh, takeover defenses uh, and, 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 your, uh, and your results. So it could be that Actually, some of the defense removals led to less takeovers uh, because you know, the, the, the threat of a takeover has a disciplining effect, and therefore you behave more you, and you are taken over less in some cases. It could be that there has been an, an unobserved shock, like a rise in shareholder activism, acts as substitute to takeovers, at the same time increasing allegiance to best practices. Or it could be reverse causality in the sense that because there are less takeovers, uh, managers are not clinging as much to these defenses and therefore the, the defenses go down. But I, I think it would be important to discuss that for external validity because if you look at what happens at the very end of a sample where you see that the takeover probability is like three, five percent, you might think, okay, but who, you know, uh, it, it cannot go down much more if we had additional defenses <coughs> in this firm because it's already very low. So what would be the effect of having these defenses in the, in, in the end? Now, there's, uh, 
a more, a more technical aspect that I would like to discuss, and I suppose you, you, you won't be surprised about that, uh, uh, is, is, is it, is, the question is whether it's a paper on the removal, of the actual removal of takeover defenses, or is it a paper on uh, requests to remove defenses from shoulders. And I'm saying that because, in fact, all these shoulder proposals that you est whose, estimate you you, whose effect you estimate are non-binding. Uh, and you, management is never forced to implement any of these proposals, no matter how successful they are in the vote. Uh, and, and the paper has absolutely no investigation uh, 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 on the actual implementation uh, of, these, uh, of these proposals. Essentially, it's assumed that the rate of implementation is uniform across time and across voting results, provided it reaches uh, 50%. And, and, and that uh, uh, would be interesting to include the data. So uh, it turns out that uh, with Daniel, we have collected some of that data. And here, here I'm showing before 2002 how the implementation varied with the degree to which there was support in the election. And you see that there is uh, a, a gradually increasing relationship, but you don't see uh, a big, uh, a big uh, increase at the threshold. Uh, in fact, w what you estimate is coming from a period after 2003, because that's when uh, there was starting to be a gap at the threshold. So first of all, first thing I would say is that if you want to be sure it's about takeover defenses, it would have to be that your effect takes place only after 2003 and not before 2002. Uh, second thing is that uh, what's troubling for the estimation approach, especially the matching approach, is that you see that there is a continuous effect of the vote on the probability of implementation. And actually, it's not surprising, it's just simply the fact that the vote sends a signal beyond majority. If I, if I know that 75 rather than 60% of my shoulders are want to remove it, it's going to push me a bit to remove it. And that's uh, in the, the, the paper that you mentioned that you use, Angrist and Rokanen, a failure of a generalized conditional independence assumption. Generalized because, in fact, if you wanted to do your approach completely, you would do an IV, you would collect the data on implementation, do a first stage, and then you would also do the reduce form, which you show. But the problem here is that the first stage is invalid. The first stage is invalid because of this gradual increase in implementation with the vote, which actually, uh, you would see, remains after you throw in tons of controls. It, it remains because the vote really has a causal effect on the probability of implementing, I think. I mean, I, I didn't test it, but it's very likely that even after you control, a firm that has a higher vote is more likely to implement. So, uh, so, so, so the consequence of that is that if you scale the estimates by multiplying by two or three, as you suggest, you largely overestimate the effect, especially when you are away from the threshold. The RDD estimate, the RDD IV estimate is correctly estimated. It would still be there, provided you had this data. But you are not able to compute the IV estimates away, uh, away from the threshold. You could have, and I've run a couple of simulations, and you see that this would happen even when your falsification test that you do on the reduced form is negative. Um, so. Uh, that's about it. I have yeah, other comments that uh, you might be interested uh, to read afterwards, but the main thing is that it doesn't invalidate the reduced form results you have. The only thing is that it might be that some of the results you get are not just due to the removal of defenses, but from something else. And one explanation I have is not coming from my paper, but simply, uh, simply from the fact that maybe uh, if, uh, if I see that there's lots of votes for the removal of defenses, a bidder would think that there's a good chance that he wins the bid. So it's going to attract a bidder if I see that there's lots of votes for uh, mm -hmm. uh, an attempt to remove takeover defenses, and this will only happen for votes on takeover defenses. So your falsification test based on 
voting in non-takeover provisions does not work here. If this explanation is correct, it could explain part of your reduced form results and not just the removal uh, uh, of defenses. But regardless, so I've learned a lot from the paper in terms of you know, results, uh, methods. Uh, it was great to read back Angrist. <laughs> uh, and, and, and yeah, I hope uh, the best way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's ask you for a couple of questions. And quickly, there's a short question that actually made. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, can you put back up your second slide with the effect on premiums? Quickly, because I want to make a comment on, on that. Uh, so, sorry, sorry about this. The, the comment is going to be about RDD design, uh, regression discontinuity design. And uh, so one of the things that uh, we often see, which the uh, econometric papers recommend, is that you run a local linear regression on each side of the threshold. And one of the things that's always struck me as puzzling about that uh, yeah, so, so just go down a few. I'll tell you which. No, keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, uh, next one. Next one. Yeah. So one of the things that I really distrust with this local linear regression approach is when you've got different curvatures above and below the threshold, is that real or is it just an artifact of the data where we know that the local linear regression is sensitive near the threshold? Here, the curvature is exaggerating your results, and I'd want to know some theory for why the curvature should change. I understand why there should be a jump, but in this and a number of other papers, I don't know why the curvature should change, and if I were to impose a straight line here below and above the threshold with a jump, I'd get significantly different results. And so that's going to be the comment, to distrust the local linear when you have no theoretical basis for thinking the curvature would change. Was there a requirement to vote, or why did they all vote? So, that's so say let me answer this just far. So we don't have select. We are very careful not to have selection into treatment and control, but we have a lot of selection into the sample. It's our friends that decided to vote, and that's our population, and anyway, totally up from the public. Okay, a, a, a related question: Isn't all of this somehow the fact that they, there is a population of firms voting on this? Is it related to a change in the relative power of the incumbent CEO, presumably who was protected by these provisions relative to outsiders, activists, what have you? So we've looked at a lot of criteria about selection into the sample, and we found few of them that work. One of them is actually the size, but nothing about profitability. And we've looked at other more, more menial variables, but I'd be happy to try something. Yes, thanks. Okay. Sorry, I stopped. Marco? So what did that Martin Herbig asked before, how can hedge fund activists have power with 6%? Well, they have power with 6% because in a proxy fight, other shareholders will vote for their proposal. And maybe what you're picking up here is the willingness of these shareholders to vote with the hedge fund activists in these proxy fights. And the coincidence of the period is also there because we know that hedge fund activism became more relevant after 2003. And last question. Yes, please. Is it clear that you want to set the <coughs> is it clear that you want to set the premium to zero if there's no uh, because uh, I mean we can imagine a bid and ask right and just the, the price to sell is just too high. So for some people the premium would actually be too high. And so if you look at your latest part of the sample where there's fewer transactions, you're assuming that the premium is zero, so you're getting a lower premium when there's fewer and over provisions. So maybe that's part of where you're getting your results. Thank you. Okay. Uh, after not being in answer. Okay. So first, many thanks to Laurent for, for his comment. I think implementation issues are, are relevant. I think, as you said, it's not an RDD um, paper, so we look at implementation beyond. So that means that the conversion factor between intent to treat and treatment of treatment is about 1.6, actually. It's, it's much nicer than other discontinuity. But we need to look at whether, you know, you know we can claim that there's a problem in all the implementation as well. And we didn't have the data. The before and after 2003, I'm willing to check, actually. I think that's, that's an interesting question. But, uh, 
Yes, this was all, I try to be careful. All I said is about what happens when you vote to drop a provision, or to actually drop a provision, which is a different question, actually. Um, uh, your question, there are, there's an obvious reason why you have a kind of, in, that this type of shape in this regression, which has to do with the fact that part of the premium may be anticipated, right? If you have a very high threshold, if you have a very high level of voters voting in favor of the provision, there may be a higher anticipation of a deal happening in the future, and that's already incorporated in the prices. There are obvious theoretical reasons. There are in another paper that show that the shape could be like this. In this paper, actually, it bothers us more than anything, so we actually try to control for this in one of our regressions by showing abnormal returns even before the day of the vote, right? And then the shape is slightly different, but there's, there are obvious reasons why this could happen. Uh, and here, yes, I have, I have, by the way, I have a local linear regression with optimal bandwidth, but I also show you means, really. These dots are simple means, right? And, and that's what, uh, what we get here. Um, I think I'm missing a couple of comments. Um, yeah, so zero premium, is it relevant or not? Uh, it's, not it's not the very relevant, I mean, we could assign a small premium to those that don't get less, the results qualitatively would be the same, quantitatively they would be smaller, uh, because you're reducing the bound between being taken over or not. Uh, I don't really know, I mean, if it's time changing, maybe it would have more grip, actually. Uh, if it's constant across time, nothing to, nothing changes. If it's time changing, <coughs> we have a good model to predict it, we could try uh, and that would be uh, a, good, a good question. Um, proxy uh, files, I think, yeah, and, and also related to your question, I think I'm totally sympathetic to the fact that winning a vote or not winning a vote does contain some information. Uh, but we have to be careful, it has to be discontinuous information, right? So if, a, if, an, if an activist tries to do something in a firm and it fails or, or by 40, or, sorry, if an activist sees a vote failing by 49% or vote passing by 51%, the activist must see this as very, very different. And it's not obvious why. Most give you that there's enough dissent to try or not to try, right? So I think that's a, that's a tricky thing, especially for the RDD estimates. But I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm completely sympathetic, and in our other paper we try these dynamic things that actually go in that direction. So there may be something beyond the vote, uh, beyond the proposed, the provision that is in the vote. Uh, here what we try to do is check what happens when we focus on non-antilegal provisions, and we don't find anything there. So there's something, there is definitely something about the provision. If there's something else, we cannot measure it yet, or at least in this paper. Thank you. Thank you, Vigente. Let's <coughs> hand, hand to Lobo.